Right, let me know if you got that link. Uh, should be there now. Just making sure. Yeah, should be. That's gone. Boop, boop, boop. Send that to myself. Yep, got it right here. Perfect. Right. So, again, give me two minutes while I get it out to social media. No uh, do, do, do. So, yeah, what time is it over there, Joel? Um, it's 10.58 a.m. Have you had your breakfast yet? <laughs> I have, yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and working on my third cup of coffee, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've decided to limit myself to two now because I have one of them pod machines and I ended up... Yeah, if oh, I go with yeah. three, I'm just like wired for the whole day. <laughs> uh, I wasn't planning on doing three, but it just kind of worked out that way. <laughs> right, this, let me get it out. Do -do. Hi to all who are going to be joining us soon. Um, I'm just getting this out to social media, so just bear with us while I do that. Because that's to go on Instagram and all that kind of thing. Uh, I don't think you're on Instagram, uh, are you, Joel? Uh, no, no, I actually don't have an Instagram page. I'm probably one of the last people in the world to, to not have one. Because <laughs> you'd have some great pictures on there, especially from your time on the U2. Yeah, that's true. It would be it would be cool to uh, to get one set up for all the the aviation stuff that that I'm involved with. That that may have to be a project that I work on soon. Yeah, it's. Uh... It can be fun, but at the same time, it can be an absolute nightmare. So I just yeah. My uh, my fiance and I we're we're thinking of putting uh, almost like a little YouTube channel of ours together to kind of document some of of our adventures. You know, we have two uh, airplanes of our own, and we travel around quite a bit. You know, uh, messing around with those and all of our friends and the adventures that they have too. So we've been kind of thinking about maybe it'd be fun to to do something like that. You know, there's some pretty successful uh, channels out there, but I think. You know, she's into aviation as well as I am, and with her own airplanes, I think we could have something kind of unique there. Yeah, definitely. I think you could have a mixture of both aviation and just like general cup of life, or yeah, I think that's yeah, be exactly. A, a good exactly. one for you. But uh, right, almost done here, folks. Uh, doo -doo. Uh, so, how long have you and your partner been together? Uh, she and I have been together for about three and a half years now. Three and a half years. Yep. You obviously haven't killed each other in lockdown yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not killed, but you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Might be going too maybe. far. <laughs> I think. I think she wanted to kill me a couple times. <laughs> yeah, same with my uh, my partner as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, get this out into the YouTube group. Uh, uh, uh. Are you in all them groups as well? The YouTube groups or, or like anything like that. Uh, did you say the U2 groups or the YouTube groups? U2, like the, the aircraft. Uh, yeah, I'm in several of those groups and also several of the, uh, uh, we have a, a couple private, you know, U2, uh, uh, U2 groups that were, uh, that I'm a part of, you know, with, uh, Dragon Lady Drivers and some of the alumni, you know, stuff that's out there. So yeah, there's a handful of different groups that I'm, I'm in. Yeah, so um, obviously there's a few people in now, but yeah, yeah let's tell it, tell us what you've been up to since uh, this crazy thing happened, uh, you know, four or five months ago. How has it affected you? Because last time we talked, uh, you were on the airlines. Is anything changed in that in that regard? Uh, yeah, it has actually. Real quick, I'm sorry, I should click have clicked that YouTube link by now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So. Let me let me get that let me get that set up real quick. Technical technical uh, difficulties here yeah, on my part, this, guys. Part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everything's good now. Um, yeah, so kind of kind of going or beginning with with the the state of the union, if you will, the the situation. Obviously, quite a bit has changed in the world since uh, since we last spoke. I think we uh, the last time we talked. None of the the COVID stuff had really hit yet, yeah. uh, you know, with w with everything that's that's been happening in the world. So, um, the airline industry, which you know I, I fly for a major U.S. carrier, um, it, uh, it it took a pretty steep uh, drop off. You know, we lost about ninety five percent of our of our wow. our you know, passengers and revenue, and I mean all the airlines, you know, across the board around the world, really, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're really suffering as a result. So, um, because of that, of course, uh, you know, with as many pilots as we had, 
the airlines were staffed for, you know, the, the type of flying that we were doing prior to all of this mm -hmm. occurring. So, um, I am, I am junior enough where the airline that, that I fly, is it okay if I say it? Does it matter? <laughs> no, it doesn't matter for me. Yeah. You it can say matter. what you okay. want. Yeah, yeah. So I fly for Delta mm -hmm. and, um, Delta decided that they were going to take about, uh, about the bottom 2,500 guys and, uh, and put them into what they call an unassigned status. Um, which means that we have a, a base that we fly, that we're assigned to, but we don't really have an airplane. We don't really have a position right. and it's kind of a waiting room to determine whether or not we're going to be furloughed or if they're going to bring us back in some capacity while the company and the union try and figure out what they're going to do. And, uh, I am, I'm in a position where I'm at the top of that list uh, so I'm about 250 people from the top. So if they, the company does decide to furlough in phases, uh, I'll probably be one of the last uh, guys to get furloughed if they get to me and, uh, hopefully one of the first to, to come back. So mm -hmm. all that being said, uh, I am, I am fortunate enough that I decided when I, uh, got off of active duty, uh, from active, active service with the military a couple of years ago, back in 2017, I transitioned over to the um, the Air Force Reserves, and in switching over to the Air Force Reserves, um, I shuffled around a little bit with different positions, and a position with the U-2 program uh, opened back up, but at that time, it was a non-flying position, mm -hmm. um, but there was always kind of the hope, and there was some rumor and, and some talk about the possibility of a an opportunity to fly that might be available in the future. So in looking at everything, I decided that it was worth taking advantage of, of that opportunity and kind of rolling the dice mm -hmm. to see if something was going to, to come as a result of, of the efforts that people were putting in. And we've been trying to get a flying program uh, with the with reservists for 20, 25 years or wow. longer. You know, it's mm -hmm. It's been... It's I don't know if the YouTube program has ever had, um, you know, reservists uh, that are active reservists um, that haven't you know come back to active duty or something uh, flying for the program. So anyway, long story short, uh, I've been working with the YouTube program for the last three years, you know, in the squadron doing training and syllabus, uh, you know, review and development, um, but haven't had an opportunity to fly until all this uh, this stuff uh, started happening. Mm -hmm. And when, when the world started changing, I, I kind of saw the writing on the wall and said, you know, there's, there's probably going to be some changes in the airline industry mm -hmm. and they're probably going to be significant. So I raised my hand and said, Hey, you know, I'll come back on active duty orders for a period of time. And when I did, um, it just so happened that our first, uh, reservist had just gone through requalification training okay, right. and he's a friend of mine, you know, we've known each other, you know, since, uh, since, since we both really entered the program. Um, uh, Jeff's a great guy and, and, and he was the first reservist to go through. So I kind of, I went to the, the 99th squadron commander and I said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm around, I'm available. And, um, you know, I, I kind of have my, my orders and my days, funded and paid for, you know, for a while, I'm like, would there be an opportunity to, to start flying again? And, um, he kind of took it into consideration and talked to the kind of ran it up the chain of command on, on the base. And they thought that it would be, um, a good idea. So at the moment, uh, I will be the second reservist in history that I'm aware of, uh, to get requalified in the U2 starting in a couple of weeks. Wow. That's amazing. You just yeah. wanted the food again, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I really miss my cheesy polenta and bacon. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's really what it came down to. Well, that's awesome, Joel. As you can see, there's some questions coming in the side. Remember, you can scroll up. So I'm going to let you loose on them, and I'll get the, the link out to more social media. But yeah, sure. get your questions yeah. coming in, guys, and enjoy. All right. Well, hey, I just wanted to say... Uh, you know, thank you to uh, to Mike and everybody for um, for being here. Appreciate you guys coming to to hang out with me for a little bit. Uh, this is as fun for me to do as it is uh, for you guys to to listen. I'm sure, and this is our 
uh, my third uh, podcast that I've done here with with Air Crew Interview. The first one being the interview, and I think this is our second uh, Q and A. So I'm uh, happy to be back and and talk to some of you about about some of your your questions that you have. So. Uh, just kind of getting getting right into it, you know, taking a look at at some of the the the, the questions over on the right. Let's see, Jin Zhang, he's asking, can you describe uh, some of the unique characteristics of the U2? Adverse yaw, controllability, uh, roll rate at high altitude. So, um, yeah, the U2 is a it's a it's a very interesting airplane. I think we've you know talked about this in some of the the previous um, uh, podcasts, but it was designed to fly at a very very high altitude, and uh, at very high altitude, it flies incredibly well. Uh, it's very light in the controls. It's very light in the roll rate. You it's um, uh, you obviously don't have a lot of margin uh, between you know, stall and overspeed. Uh, up at altitude, your indicated airspeed margin is is very 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 low. Even though your true airspeed is somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 420 knots or so, um, but down low, man, the thing just handles like a dump truck. To be honest with you, it's uh, it's kind of unbalanced in its flight controls, meaning it's very light in pitch but very heavy in roll. So it's kind of this balance that you have to find. Uh, between you know not not uh, pitching too much with the airplane, um, but uh, anticipating that roll. So you really have to be uh, uh, really thinking ahead when you are are wanting to make a turn with the airplane down low. And of course, with those very very long wings, you have a lot of adverse yaw. Uh, so you really have to be on top of the rudder uh, down low as well. So it's really um, kind of you know we it's like an athletic event uh, down low where you are just using every ounce of strength that you have, um, you know, moving the yoke around, being on top of the rudder pedals, uh, every ounce of strength and coordination uh, that you have. And it really takes your full concentration in order to be able to uh, fly that airplane well down low in the traffic pattern and uh, and bringing it in for a, a landing it's it, especially when you're dealing with um, crosswinds uh, when you're dealing with a lot of uh, you know turbulence uh, if there you know if it's a hot afternoon here in northern california you know it regularly gets up into you know in excess of 100 degrees and we have a lot of thermal activity and and those wings it's, you know the airplane's built like a glider so you're getting a lot of uh, you're picking up a lot of that lift. The airplane's very much affected by um, uh, by you know thermal activity, uh, so you're you're getting bounced around. The air conditioning in the airplane is terrible, so you're sweating, you're soaking wet, and uh, it's it's just it's a lot of fun, actually. But it's it's definitely a workout uh, flying that airplane down low. But up high, you're in the spacesuit. You're nice and cool. Uh, that's where the airplane is is designed to be flown. It's happy, um, uh, and 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 it flies very very well at altitude. To be honest, so uh, very uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Kind of a, a drastic contrast between down low and up high. And just another another way that it's uh, it's an interesting airplane. Uh, let's see. Um, the freckle punny. Uh, how close would you two get to enemy airspace in combat? Um, interesting question. I can't really get too much into you know tactics and techniques and procedures, uh, but uh, I'll kind of talk about it in general terms. Um, the U2 and any other intelligence asset that the uh, the U.S. military is flying, for the most part, uh, are considered very high value assets. And as a high value asset, we try and protect those assets to the best of our ability. So we're going to be flying those aircraft as far away uh, from any kind of enemy threats and avoid any kind of enemy threats to the best of our ability, depending on what kind of equipment we have on board in order to be able to, to do that. We very well may put uh, protection in between 
uh, uh, enemy forces and us in order to, again, try and mitigate any sort of threats. But uh, really, the, the primary way that any kind of high value asset, whether it be tanker aircraft, uh, whether it be intelligence aircraft or anything else that we really want to protect, distance uh, is our friend. So in order to um, make up for the fact that we want to physically be as far away from enemy activity as possible, uh, the equipment that we have on board is capable of looking great distances. And we have a lot of different ways to do that. But uh, a, being a standoff platform, being able to look long distances, which is uh, one of the things that our altitude allows us to do, uh, that is really where we get a lot of our, our capability from. So um, we don't want to get too close to you know the action, if you will. We prefer to be a casual observer from from afar if that if that makes uh, if that makes any sense. So uh, that's really uh, kind of of uh, a situation. Now back in the day, when the U two first uh, when the U two is first developed, they didn't have the capabilities that we do today in terms of standoff weaponry, the the data links and the cameras and the the the, the capabilities that we have. It had to be an overflight asset. So when the airplane was first designed, um, you know, its its specs required uh, an aircraft that was to be flown over 60,000 feet, which at the time was uh, thought to be higher than any surface to air threat could reach. So Kelly Johnson came up with a, a design that that did that. And they did that by saving weight uh, by any means possible. And uh, really doing everything that they could to make sure that the airplane, you know, flew very well at, at high altitude. And the cameras they had on board were film cameras. We actually still have one today called the OBC. Um, but they they had wet film. They took pictures as the aircraft overflew enemy territory, hopefully high enough where it wasn't going to be subject to uh, enemy action. So very, very different from what used to be the mission of the U-2, which was overflight, uh, to what we do today, where it's more of a standoff uh, type weapon using technology to get closer to, uh, to the fight. So that's kind of, kind of how, how we operate uh, with our particular platform. Uh, TF was asking if cosmic radiation exposure is a concern for U-2 pilots, given that you fly so high. Uh, the answer to that is yes, as a matter of fact. Um, it's kind of something that's a little bit, uh, again, unique to the U-2. Uh, we fly with dosimeters on board, and that takes, uh, that, you know, that uh, device stays with us, uh, you know, for your entire career, and they kind of... Uh, they track how much radiation you are being exposed to. We do monitor space weather, uh, depending on what is going on with solar flares and things like that. Um, it could have an effect on whether or not we fly. Generally speaking, um, activity is not, uh, you know, solar activity is not uh, active enough or strong enough uh, for it to affect us, but it is something that we do keep an eye on. And um, that they say, I don't have any numbers to back this up, but what the flight docs tell us when we go through our training is that we're uh, exposed to generally about three times as much solar radiation as you would be at about 30,000 feet in your typical airliner. So it is a significant amount of radiation that you are exposed to at altitude. Um, I do know in, in the YouTube program, there have been some folks that have had some uh, interesting, um, not interesting, but unfortunate, uh, uh, medical, uh, problems in terms of cancers and, and, and things like that. Nobody's really ever directly correlated them to the solar radiation that, you know, we, uh, we receive at altitude, but, you know, unfortunate, you know, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, cancer just, you know, happens to certain people. 
Um, but I certainly would not, uh, you know, put it past put it past anyone that it doesn't have the amount of radiation that we're exposed to has a positive doesn't have a positive effect. Uh, so it could certainly have been a contributing factor. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely something that we keep tabs on. A lot of people wonder if there's any kind of uh, solar protection, uh, any sort of radiation barrier. Uh, either on the aircraft or the suit, and the answer to that is no, there is not. Nothing in the, the windows, there's no coating on the windows, nothing around the cockpit, uh, and the spacesuit itself is not really a, um, it's not really a uh, protective layer against uh, solar radiation either. So uh, it definitely is a concern. Um, and then of course the other, uh, the other thing, you know, that was really a concern, uh, was, um, you know, the, 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 the atmosphere that you're in breathing hundred percent oxygen at those altitudes, um, uh, in the old aircraft and in our current two seat aircraft, which don't have the, the cockpit, um, altitude reduction effort, it's the care modification is what we call it. Uh, those airplanes, um, you're sitting at a cabin altitude of about 30,000 feet, uh, which means you're the, the pressure inside the cockpit is equivalent to sitting on top of, of Mount Everest. So at those pressures, everything becomes exponentially difficult, um, to do anything, whether it be pick up a checklist or whether it be just, you know, turn around or feed yourself. Everything is just takes effort. So you have to methodically and very slowly kind of go through whatever it is that that you're doing. And um, anyway, the uh, there's actually a couple studies that are being done right now and have been been in in the works for the last couple of years, uh, where there are some doctors that have been studying uh, the brains of U2 pilots and. What we do is uh, at the beginning of our careers, just uh, right after we get hired, you'll go get an MRI and they'll kind of they'll they'll take that initial MRI and they'll allow you to go through a couple of years of, of your career and operational flying. And then they'll take another MRI of the brain. And it's really one of the, the few instances that doctors um, have an opportunity to study uh, the effects of of what um being exposed to a high altitude environment uh, does to, to the human brain, and I'm I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know a lot of the details about about that, but I do know that those studies um, are still currently uh, in progress, and um, yeah, kind of interesting that they're that they're actually taking a look at that, but. Uh, high altitude radiation, kind of getting back to that. Yep, it's a definite concern. We we monitor it, and uh, and if it become if it's too much of a a problem on a particular day, um, there is the possibility that we won't fly. You know, depending on the the uh, the priority of the mission and where we are in the world and and that kind of thing. So, good question. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, Jerry, I love you. <laughs> uh, what keeps the U2 in service with the introduction of, uh, satellites and RPAs such as the RQ4? Kind of the age old question, you know, why is the manned U2 around, uh, when there's other high altitude assets that can do the same thing? Um, the, uh, it's, it's kind of a, I'll give a short answer to, uh, to what could be a very long answer to uh, a short question. Um, but basically is the U2 is very, very good at what it does. Um, and since the U2 has been, um, allowed to stick around, we're fortunate in that there has been a lot of money in recent times, uh, pushed to the program with new sensors and development of technology. And we have a lot of really neat stuff that is, uh, that is coming to the, the program. Um, there have been so many different studies from the uh, financial impact of the U2 versus, uh, you know, the RQ4. And I'm not going to get into the, the details of that. Um, but believe it or not, the U2 is less expensive to operate uh, than the RQ4 is for a lot of uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, the U2 is what we call a multi-int platform. In other words, it can do a lot of things at once. Uh, we can do them at a higher altitude. Um, and, but not necessarily for as long of a period of time 
as the RQ4. And uh, the U2 is more capable. It's it's more capable in the weather that it's able to fly in. The RQ4 is very, very weather limited. Um, I don't know who decided that they needed to be flying out of North Dakota as one of their uh, locations that they're they're flying out of. But uh, their their aircraft cannot absolutely positively cannot handle any icing conditions. Um, And uh, it doesn't have weather radar at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of reasons uh, that are weather related that uh, limit the airplane and it flies, you know, uh, significantly lower uh, than the U-2 does. So that also limits its range. Um, so a lot of different reasons with regards to the RQ-4. And when we take a look at at the satellite side of things, um, satellites are, are a very, very high value asset, obviously, and they're very, very heavily tasked. And unless the satellite is in geosynchronous orbit, you know, we have a 90 minute orbit that occurs, uh, with these, with these satellites as they're going, uh, as they're orbiting around the planet and we can't easily turn one around and say, Hey, go back and take a look at this or take a look at that. Uh, if we're lucky enough to get imagery on a satellite target deck, it's kind of a, a snapshot of what is happening at that time as the satellite is passing over. And then you have to wait another 90 minutes to see what's going on. Unless there is a geosynchronous satellite that the priority of whatever the target is, is determined that it needs to be sitting there. And honestly, I don't even know if that, uh, you know, I don't know any details about capabilities like that that exists, although I'm sure they, they probably do. Um, uh, so the U-2 is, it's the U-2 and the, the RQ-4 for that matter, uh, were very much more adaptable, um, than the, uh, the satellite technology is, um, and we're able to maneuver and kind of go back, uh, to check on, on things and be able to, to, to observe certain areas for lengths of time that are just not possible, uh, with satellite, um, satellites as, as the way we use them today. So that's kind of how, how I understand it and friends that I, I have that are in the, the space and, and missile uh, business have kind of uh, have described it to me. So let's see here. Let's take a look at uh, some more questions. Is there an autopilot for the U-2? Uh, yes, there is an autopilot for the U-2. Um, we do not turn the autopilot on until we hit about 52,000 feet. Uh, as we're climbing, everything is flown by hand. And once we reach 52,000, that's uh, kind of a, a, a gate for us as far as uh, uh, accomplishing some checklist items. Uh, and one of those items is to turn the autopilot on. So I'll turn the autopilot on at that point. I'll kind of set up my my nest in my cockpit. Um, I'll set the speed for decimal 715, which is our, our cruising altitude, or sorry, our cruising speed. And we, I'll, I'll get myself set up for a constant Mach climb. So what that means is that I will set Mach 715 and I will leave the throttle at max. And what happens is the airplane will start climbing at that constant Mach and throughout the entire mission, I will leave, with very few exceptions, uh, leave the throttle at max. Um, uh, and, and the airplane, as it burns off fuel, will continue to just climb higher and higher and higher. And we will never, um, very rarely, uh, level off over the course of a mission. So as you burn off more fuel, you get higher and higher. And actually, the highest altitude that I reach is just before I start my initial descent coming back to the field at the end of a mission. Uh, at that point in time, I'll have reached my, uh, I'll have burned off as much fuel as I'm going to for the mission. I'll have reached my highest altitude and our, our flight planning software accounts for that, uh, gradual climb. Uh, and as we climb, of course you burn less and less fuel. So it's all planned for and, and taken into consideration. And then uh, just before you start that initial descent, uh, the first thing that I do is drop my landing gear. Uh, so I'll drop my landing gear and at, you know, at operational cruise altitudes, gear comes down first thing. Then I'll go, I'll, you know, let it settle for a little while and I'll pop out my speed brakes, 
let things settle down. I'll pop up the spoilers and uh, and then I'll pull the power back out of Max and I'll bring it back to idle and let the airplane start to come down. And again, as I'm descending, passing about 52,000 feet, the autopilot will come off and I'll start to hand fly the aircraft again all the way back down to landing. So autopilot's used in cruise only. It works very well. Um, it's very basic. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's an altitude hold feature. Uh, there's the nav feature, which will hook itself up to the navigation of the aircraft. So you don't have to worry about that, but there's a, there's just a heading select, uh, feature. It's not even heading select. It's really just, um, uh, like a roll, uh, feature of the airplane. So, um, just a very basic, uh, autopilot and, and yeah, so but it works well. And up at altitude, it's actually required uh, that we do use it. Um, the control forces um, are so light that without the autopilot, it's really almost impossible to hand fly. And the positioning of the aircraft needs to be so accurate um, based on the the needs of the sensors that we're um, taking pictures and, and doing all of our work with. They need to be uh, on a platform that's flown very, very accurately. And the autopilot is is really the best way um, to do that. So, let's see. <clears throat> this is uh, something that I don't know if we've got into uh, before. Is there a mission control uh, ground command center that directs and tracks your mission, or do you function autonomously? Um, so. Again, when the U-2 was developed, uh, it was developed for Soviet overflight, and that was done autonomously. Uh, they were they operated in radio blackout. Uh, they didn't talk to anybody over the course of, of their mission, and it was completely, uh, you're off the grid. You're, you take off at a certain time, and you're supposed to land at a certain time, and if enough time elapsed at your landing location and you didn't show up, then they started then they started looking for you. Um, that is not the case anymore. Uh, if you look at an operational U-2 and you take a look at the uh, the hump on the back of the uh, back of the airplane, uh, some people think that's a fuel tank or what have you. It's it's actually a satellite dish, and that satellite dish links us back up to a ground station. And that ground station, uh, a lot, there's a couple different ways to, to do that. Um, uh, but that ground station is called the, uh, the DCGS. And uh, it's the Distributed Common Ground Station, I believe, is what it stands for. And at those locations, we have an entire team of people, generally 60 to 70 folks, um, that are working on our mission. Uh, when, I am, when I am flying and I am linked up to this ground station. Uh, I'm talking to a mission controller. Uh, we call it the mock, the mission operations controller. And they are typically an intelligence officer, and they are effectively in charge of the intelligence collection side of our mission. Uh, they will be the ones that are responsible for and kind of in charge of all of the folks that are doing intelligence collection at the DGS. So there's going to be uh, other sensor operators uh, at the DGS. There's going to be analysts. There's going to be linguists. There's going to be all kinds of people um, uh, that are monitoring the mission, that are watching everything that is taking place. Uh, there's going to be people that are looking at threats in the area and other intelligence officers that are monitoring the situation. And you really have a tremendous amount of people that are working on the mission that you are are flying. So even though as a pilot, you know you're up there, you're you're driving the bus, if you will, um, you are effectively flying an airplane that virtually has 70 people uh, in the back of the airplane, and they are really the ones that are responsible for making the mission happen and employing all of the capabilities that the airplane has. And uh, it's it's pretty cool when you when you are able to go to the DGS 
and take a look. I mean, it it really does look like something, you know, straight out of the movies. They've got, you know, the screens everywhere and they have the the big boards up on the wall and all of these people at all of their desks. And and uh, during during an actual mission, uh, it's kind of quiet. Everybody's very, you know, busy uh, doing doing what they uh, what they do. And and it's it's very cool to uh, to see and watch um, and the capabilities are just amazing. You know, the things that they're able to to see and hear and and all of that. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. So good question. Thank you. Um, (laughs) The survival systems that the U2 has ejection seats, life rafts and uh, how can U2 pilots expect to evade capture if using bright yellow pressure suits that can't be removed? (laughs) All questions that I had when I first uh, started the the program. Um, so the U two, just like any other um, any other uh, you know single seat combat aircraft, uh, I'm sure I'm probably missing something, but uh, it has an ejection seat, um, uh, just like uh, you know, just like a, a, an F sixteen or an F fifteen or something. Uh, so the airplane that you do have the ability to eject out of the aircraft. Um, you have the ability to eject out of the aircraft at both low altitude. Uh, it's a great seat, zero, zero ejection seat, um, or high altitude, believe it or not. Um, that is, uh, the, one of the big reasons behind wearing the full pressure suit, the space suit that we wear, uh, that suit is capable of, of being used, uh, in orbit. It's the same, uh, it's the same suit that the astronauts, used to use on the shuttle missions back in the 80s uh, and 90s when the, the shuttles were, when the shuttle was flying. Um, so you, the ejection sequence at altitude is, is kind of interesting. Uh, when you punch out of the airplane, of course, at 70,000 feet, you don't want your parachute coming out right away. So what will generally happen, and down low, it's a completely different sequence. It kind of happens just like you you normally see uh, an ejection if you you know watch a, a video or something. Uh, but at altitude, if you had to punch out for whatever reason, and generally speaking, there aren't many reasons why you would need to punch out at altitude, um, with the exception of maybe like an in-flight breakup or a fire where you had to get out uh, quickly. If you punched out, uh, you have an emergency oxygen bottle that'll keep about 15 minutes of oxygen flowing into the mask so so you can continue to breathe. Uh, But you uh, eject out of the seat and man seat separation, which is typically automatic uh, and occurs very, very shortly after the ejection sequence is initiated. uh, So that way your parachute deploys. That doesn't actually happen for quite some time. Uh, So you will free fall in strapped into the seat with a drogue chute deployed on the back of the seat. So you're actually going to be falling face down, uh, still strapped to the seat, the drogue chute behind you, probably spinning pretty good, um, until you hit about 15,000 feet. And at 15,000 feet, uh, there will be man seat, uh, man seat separation will take place and you'll separate from the seat. You're, parachute will deploy at that point and from there everything is going to be normal but um it's when you pull that handle at altitude i never have hope i never will uh but when that happens it's actually a several minute free fall um before you even come out of your seat so it's kind of an interesting sequence uh when you take a when you look at it from that standpoint and then from a survival standpoint you're you're in your suit you have your uh, oxygen, uh, your, your face shield, when you're normally in the airplane, your face shield is actually, uh, electrically heated to prevent any kind of, uh, fog, any kind of fogging, excuse me, any kind of fogging from taking place. And when you eject, um, that electric charge is no longer there. Uh, so it's very likely that, you know, from breathing and condensation that your face mask or your face shield is going to, uh, to fog up, um, and, and most likely freeze over. Um, so that could be, 
uh, a little detrimental. So uh, that's where you really want that um, automatic man seat separation to take place at, at 15,000 feet. Um, so anyway, all that being said, you uh, you eject out of the airplane, your canopy deploys, and then you hit the ground and you're potentially somewhere where you uh, don't want to be, and now you're in a bright yellow suit and you look like Big Bird running around uh, in the middle of the forest. And um, <laughs> yeah. evasion, when you go through Air Force Survival School, typically, you know, uh, uh, putting on a bright yellow suit is the last thing uh, that they teach you to do. Um, so, yeah, you, uh, you, you actually go through... Um, uh, you actually go through a survival training course that is specific to the YouTube program, and they teach you how to manage all that. And we do have the ability to take the suit off. Um, it's challenging. Typically, it takes at least a person or two to help you get out of the thing. Um, but it is possible to take the suit off, but it's it's a lot of work, and it takes some time, and you have to contort <laughs> yourself into some positions that – that might be a little difficult to get yourself out of and and all of that, but um, it is possible. The, the problem is is that if you take the suit off, you lose a lot of the uh, protection you know that it gives you. Uh, you know the 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 protection from the elements. Uh, it really is a pretty you know sealed up suit. You know I would obviously try and take the helmet off and and things, but if you can manage it, you know try and and keep the suit on. Um, but if you take it off. Underneath that suit, all I'm wearing is long johns. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I don't carry any sort of, uh, you know, additional clothing with me, and, and I don't think anybody else does either. So, um, yeah, it could be it could be interesting. Um, you know, you one hopes that that uh, that that day never comes where we have to deal with something like that. But, um, yeah, certainly something to think about. Were there any inter-service rivalries between the U-2 and SR-71 pilots? I'm sure there were plenty of jokes at the bar uh, talking about, you know, who flies faster and who does things faster and this and this and that. But <laughs> I, I don't know. I've met a couple uh, a couple SR-71 guys um, that still live in the area, and they're all great guys. So, um, But I'm sure that there were some, some bar jokes uh, that went around. Uh, let's see. Matt Irishman's asking, uh, YouTube pilots almost, he read that they almost, uh, the YouTube pilots almost exclusively fly the plane, uh, while the onboard systems are handled by ground operators. Considering the long haul flights, how do you spend your time, uh, just sitting there? Um, well, you're not, you're, you are, you know, just sitting there and the ground, uh, the, the, the DGS, um, are the folks that are typically operating, uh, the sensors on board the aircraft. Um, but you as a pilot really have a lot of responsibility in terms of managing the, the systems on board. Uh, you're dealing a lot with the mock in terms of, uh, making sure that the aircraft is in the position that it needs to be in. Uh, if they need to go back and check on something, then you are responsible for, um, uh, making sure that the, the flight plan is programmed appropriately. And that might sound easy, but with the systems that we have on board, they're a little bit antiquated. So, uh, they actually do take a little bit of manipulation in order to do that kind of thing. Um, you are the eyes and the ears of the mock in terms of, uh, uh threat reaction, at, at altitude, you're even though that they're keeping an eye on things, you're going to be the first person that knows if something is is going on. So you're kind of always keeping tabs on the situation around you. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just kind of it's it's just a means of of being proactive and staying active in the cockpit, monitoring everything to make sure that things are working as they should. Uh, with the sensors that we have, they're very finicky. Um, they are reliable, but you know they take some encouragement sometimes. So we have a lot of different checklists that we can run um, to help that process uh, take place. Uh, you're monitoring um, the data links. You're, there's a lot of monitoring and making sure that everything is working properly. Um, and in the downtown down time that I do get, uh, usually 
transitioning, you know, from uh, our operating base to our operating location, you know, I might bring a book with me or something and, and just read a little bit, um, you know, in our, our hour long, hour or two long flights or wherever it is that we, we need to go before we get on station. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, kind of how it normally, how it normally runs. Um, uh, cause there is some, some drone time, you know, between, uh, between the base and, and where you're going. And then when you're all done, when you're going off station and it's time to come home again, there's really not much else to do at that point as well. So good time to, to pull out a book or pull out a checklist or that in-flight guide or something that you haven't taken a look at and, and just kind of study up a little bit. So it's generally what we, what we end up doing. Uh, let's see. We'll take Let's see. Is it possible to become a U2 pilot if you're an RAF pilot, <laughs> say an experienced C-17 or or uh, Hercules pilot? Can you apply or write to the unit? I don't think so. Um, right now, we've even had a couple guys from other U.S. services, uh, um, Marines, Army, Navy, uh, that have asked to do an inter-service transfer over to the over to the U.S. Uh, or sorry, over to the Air Force and come to fly the U-2. And right now, even that program is turned off. Um, so as far as a joint, uh, you know, flying program, I don't think that that is currently available. So um, although, you know, something to keep an eye on uh, for in the future. So let's see. Sorry, guys. I'm just taking a look at some of the questions here. I want to try and get something uh, answered from from everybody. Uh, give everybody a, a chance here. Let's see, has the YouTube been used much for humanitarian or natural disaster missions? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, it has. Uh, we uh, have been asked to go survey um, quite a few different areas. If I'm not 100% certain about the tsunami in Japan. Um, not 100% certain about that one, if we were asked to go uh, survey that area. But we've done some, we've done some uh, hurricane. Uh, I know after Katrina uh, happened back in, I forget what year that was right off the top of my head, but we went to go do some, uh, some aerial surveying of, of New Orleans and what had happened in that area. So it definitely is something that we do. Obviously it's a case by case basis and uh, everything has to be approved appropriately by whatever governments are asking us to, to do the, the imagery, but absolutely humanitarian and, and natural disaster emissions are something that we have the ability to do, uh, you know, pending all the, the correct approval and, and whatnot. So uh, let's see. Can you share with us some of the most magical or beautiful sights you've seen of space, Earth, and stars from a high altitude? Um, that is one of the coolest uh, things about you know flying the airplane. In, in from my perspective, is the is the view that you get from uh, altitude. Um, I can remember you know coming home from uh, I think I I talked about this once, but coming home from from uh, an Iraq mission one day, um, you know flying. Uh, down the Gulf, it was the most eerie feeling of, uh, it was in the evening, and the Terminator line, which is the separation between uh, light and dark, was starting to to rise, and that shadow is very, very well defined at altitude, and I'm kind of looking ahead of me uh, down into darkness, and I'm able to see the city lights, and I'm seeing the oil rigs in the Persian Gulf, and, and uh, you know, it's for all intents and purposes, for those folks on the ground in front of me, it's nighttime. And looking behind me, I'm so high that I'm actually able to still see the sun. Uh, the sun is still up behind my shoulder. Um, but I am looking down into night in front of me. It was one of the coolest things. Um, flying over the North Atlantic, uh, if I'm, uh, I was bringing an airplane from the U.S., uh, bringing it overseas, I was over the North Atlantic and uh, seeing the northern lights from altitude was one of the coolest uh, things that I have ever seen. 
um, watching them be able, watching them just the most clear, intense, uh, bright northern lights, uh, just watching them dance, you know, in the sky there was just absolutely incredible. Um, and, and being able to see the curvature of the earth and see, you know, our planet from that perspective and just kind of realize how small <laughs> we, we all are and how small everything is, uh, relative to, you know, the world is, uh, it's just an, it's an incredible feeling. So, um, there definitely is that element of, uh, flying the U2 that makes it pretty special. Uh, let's see. Steve Lehman asks, uh, with those long slender wings, does it make a good glider? Uh, if the engine went out, do you practice emergency landing procedures for this? And is there, is it a reliable engine? Uh, yes, that is the case. The airplane makes an incredibly good glider, actually. Um, with the engine out, uh, you know, we would we would set a a min sync um, or best glide speed, depending on what we were looking for, and and you could glide a a significant distance, especially from operational altitudes. Um, so it allows you to have a, a much wider range of of emergency airfield options, uh, which can be fairly important depending on what part of the world that you're you're flying in. There's definitely places that you do not want to go down in. Um, we do practice emergency landing procedures for this. Uh, we call them SFOs or simulated flame out patterns. And we will practice them from all different uh, positions uh, around the, the traffic pattern uh, from, I haven't personally done one from altitude, but you can usually get the uh, you know get the the idea of what you're you're trying to do. If you go you know five or ten miles away from the field and then pull the engine back to idle and uh, you know you're coordinating with the tower, but we're we have procedures for uh, for managing all of that and you practice aligning yourself uh, with the positions around the field. And what we do the simulated flame out patterns will initially go to what's called a high key position. So generally that high key is a couple thousand feet directly above the field and we'll get ourselves set up to do a uh, power off spiral around the field, meeting certain um, energy gates, uh, if you will, it's speeds and altitudes that we're trying to meet as we fly this spiral pattern around the field. Uh, it's very typical for single engine, um, single engine aircraft, especially military aircraft to fly these types of patterns. It's no different from uh, what an F-16 you know, pilot would be practicing. Uh, the only difference is, is that our altitudes are going to be significantly lower because our glide profile is so much better uh, than an F-16. And in an F-16, I think their high key is somewhere around eight to 10,000 feet above the field, and they fly a single pattern. Um, for us, uh, for us, you know, that's only going to be 1,500 to 2,000 feet above the ground, depending on our flat position and, and uh, uh, situation that we're trying to simulate. So much, much lower. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, uh, it flies very well, uh, power off and it, it does glide very well as well. So, uh, let's see. Scott Pike asks, hi Joel, from a pilot's point of view, uh, what would you have improved or changed on the U2? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, when when they designed this airplane, they designed it very, very well to accomplish the the mission at hand. Uh, I think every pilot would like more power, um, although the airplane has a ton of power as it is. Uh, it does not need an afterburner or anything like that. And the engine is well designed and highly tuned to fly at the altitudes that it does. Um, it would be nice to fly even a little bit higher. They've talked about adding winglets to the airplane. Uh, of course, all this is, you know, depending on uh, pending money and, and, and you know, all, all that. But they've talked about adding winglets to the airplane, which would add another several thousand feet to the, you know, max operating altitudes of the airplane, which would be um, kind of cool. Uh, from a, from a inside the cockpit um, uh, changes, I would try and make maybe the air conditioning <laughs> a little bit more powerful and 
strangely enough, one of the first things that comes to my mind when I think of improvements or changes that could be made in the cockpit, aside from your standard, oh, improve the avionics or do this or do that, or um, uh, uh, cockpit lighting is one that could really, really be improved. Uh, flying that airplane at night is kind of a disaster. And then <laughs> the size of the liquid waste tank. <laughs> we, it's only big enough. It's just below the cockpit and it's only big enough, uh, to get about three, uh, uh, three sessions in <laughs> of, of expelling waste, uh, liquid waste, um, before it's full and then you need to switch over to a piddle pack. So a very common, uh, thing that a U2 pilot will tell you is they wish that they had a bigger, um, liquid waste, big, bigger P tank, uh, underneath the, underneath the airplane. So Joel, I think we're going to kind of wrap up now, but, uh, if you pick one, it's a great question to finish on. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. Yeah. But I'd actually like you to pick one more and then I'm actually going to jump in and ask you one more before we wrap up. If you're happy with that. Okay. Let's see. (laughs) Uh, We'll just take a look at one more here. I like the "Wow, you guys get a lot of ladies" question. That's that's a good one. <laughs> I'll let my fiance uh, uh, answer that one. But the most jaw dropping capability of the U two, you know, it's ultimately it's just such a unique and and interesting airplane to fly. There's so many amazing capabilities that it has, but I'd have to say that at the end of the day, it's it's the ride that it gives you the um, the ability to you know jump in this airplane that has you know an incredibly powerful uh, jet engine um, these incredibly long wings that provide such a great amount of lift and to be able to you know bring that throttle to max and experience what it's like to uh, take off in that airplane I'll tell you what there is uh, there's nothing quite like it and then to do that um alone you know by yourself in this airplane wearing this 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 space suit this weird contraption on your body that you need to learn to um to live in you know for the next eight to ten hours taking off and going to fly this airplane a tremendous distance from home by yourself Uh, but at the same time you are are you know, in communication with and linked up to 60 or 70 other people that are on the ground, you know, to make this happen and, uh, and do that for eight to 10 hours and then bring the airplane home and, um, and, you know, live to fly another day. Uh, plus that combined with the people that are a part of the program, I think that's probably one of the best parts about the YouTube program is the people that it attracts. Um, it's a, it's a program that you have to interview, uh, to be a part of, and you have to be brought in. Um, you know, they call it the brotherhood for a reason, and it really is an incredible group of people, uh, that, that are a part of the program and that have been, uh, throughout its history. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's once you're a U2 guy, you're, you're always uh, a U2 guy and it's a very special and small community, uh, to be a part of. So, uh, for all those reasons, that that really is what makes it uh, such a, a special airplane, a special community uh, to be a part of in in the world of aviation. So those stole drag guys have nothing on us when it comes to. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Still, still am involved, and in, and in actually being home a little bit more has allowed me to uh, to be um, uh, more involved uh, than I had been able to when I was running around with uh, with the airlines. So that's still going well. For for those of you that uh, that may not know, um, I uh, I'm a, a member of and fly with and participate with a, a group called the Patriots Jet Team. Uh, we kind of do a lot of different things, you know, at uh, at in our most public. Um, display. It's a it's an air show team, and I I'm not one of the demo pilots. I don't fly in the the the, the aerial demonstration. Those are all former Blue Angels and Thunderbirds and, and guys that have been doing it for for 20 years. But we have a six ship 
um, a six ship demo team that we fly in air shows on the West Coast. They're all uh, L-39s, very much like the Breitling team uh, that you would see, you know, over in Europe. Um, but then there's another, uh, there's a couple other elements of the the Patriots. Uh, it's an all volunteer organization. Everybody that uh, participates is a volunteer. I've been with them for almost five years now, wow. and uh, all of the the maintenance is done um, by by uh, volunteers. But these are our guys that are you know A and P's and folks that are very experienced in in working on these aircraft, and and uh, it, it's very unique from that standpoint. And then we have the Patriots Jet Team Foundation. So the goal behind the air show team and the public demonstrations is to really uh, bring an awareness and bring aviation to younger folks uh, to be able to introduce them to flight. Uh, and for us, you know, the guys that are working on the airplanes that are flying the jets, um, to be able to to give back. So we have um, scholarship programs that have been. Uh, set up to be able to provide ground school, to be able to provide uh, uh, scholarships through solo, uh, scholarships for a full private pilot's license. Um, we really do a lot of work throughout the year to be able to provide uh, those scholarships to kids. And we also have um, uh, uh, educational programs. We've partnered with several schools uh, in the Bay Area and here in Northern California to be able to hold uh, classes that uh, introduce kids to aviation. Uh, we'll bring them to the hangar. We have guest speakers that come in. I'll usually go down and talk about military careers. We have different people from all different career fields in aviation that come to talk to to the kids and really kind of give them an idea of what's available to them if a career in aviation, excuse me, is what they want to pursue. Um, so that's a very uh, cool aspect of the Patriots. Um, a couple other things that are a little bit uh, lesser known. We also have a very unique uh, camera platform. We call it the Cinejet. You can check it out at uh, cinejet.com. Um, in partnership with uh, uh, Helenet out of Southern California, we do a lot of um, uh, aerial cinematography and filming. Uh, we actually just uh, finished a while ago uh, doing the new um, uh, the new Top Gun movie. Uh, so we were the Never camera heard about <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just got delayed. <laughs> Again. It did till next year, yeah. <laughs> to July 2nd of next yeah. year. Um, but we were the aerial, uh, we were the aerial camera platform, the, the Cinejet. Yep. It was the aerial camera platform for uh, all of the aerial sequences in, in Top Gun. So that's very, very cool. And uh, we have some other, other unique projects that are uh, that are also in the works. Uh, you can go check out uh, patriotsglobaltraining.com and we have a, uh, a new um, training program uh, that's actually being developed. It's it's available but there's some some parts of it that are also still kind of currently in the works uh, and that is all uh, all yet to come. So so it's a it's a very cool organization to be to be a part of. The owner uh, Randy Howell is a good friend of mine and uh, just an amazing individual. He was a former United Airline captain. Uh, he took an early medical retirement and he really put all of his energy into the Patriots jet team and, and creating what it is. Um, and you know, all the volunteers and, and all the people that work with him, uh, to really give back yeah. to aviation really makes it a very unique and special, um, thing to be a part of. So definitely. So just for our viewers, is it best to just put uh, Patriots uh, jet team into Google and then they can find everything there or is like a main website where everything's linked? Uh, I think you can go to uh, pjtf.org. That'll take you to the foundation website mm -hmm. and you should be able to get everywhere from there. Uh, you can check out cinejet.com. Uh, that's Helenet's uh, page on the Cinejet where you can check out the, uh, uh, the capabilities of, of our camera platform. And then you can go to uh, patriotsglobaltraining.com and you can see uh, some of the um, training that is available uh, and some of the stuff that's coming online that we have as well. Certainly a very cool organization, I'll say that, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Joel, what a privilege to have you on again. It's always great to have you on as a guest. And uh, thank you to everyone that came in on the chat and answered, uh, asked some questions. I think, Joel, you gave us some great detailed answers there. So thank you very much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, and hopefully, uh, back, maybe at the end of the year, we'll get you back on once you're back into the reserves with the U2, just to hear about what that experience was like. That would be absolutely great. That would be a blast.
Awesome, Joel. Speak to you soon, Matt. Okay, very good.